Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining tonight's Ask the Experts virtual event, specifically themed, Keeping a Pulse on Your Heart Health. I'm Nick Ruthman. I'm a cardiologist here at the Cleveland Clinic, and joining me this evening are three other Cleveland Clinic cardiologists who I'm really fortunate to call colleagues. Here at the Cleveland Clinic, we're nationally ranked and globally recognized as a world leader in cardiovascular care. We provide heart care at multiple locations across Northeast Ohio and beyond, and if you need us, we would be honored to see and take care of you. We're here tonight to answer your questions, share our expertise, and provide clinical insights on a few key topics, specifically how to maintain a heart-healthy lifestyle, ways to manage chronic heart conditions and risk factors, information on when a condition should prompt you to see a physician, how wearable technology can be used to monitor vitals and health habits, plus we will help direct you on where you can find trustworthy resources for heart health information in the future. So we had more than 700 questions submitted for tonight's event, and we'll do the best we can to answer many as we can. We will also send you out an email after the event that includes heart healthy resources. If you still have any questions after this event, please call the following number, 866-289-6911, or email heartcenter, that's all one word, at ccf.org to get in touch with a nurse who can help you learn more about your condition and treatment options, and also help you choose the right doctor. But before we get to the questions, I'd like to let the panelists take a few minutes to introduce themselves. They will share a little bit about their background, and we're all going to go around and answer the question, in the busyness of life, what do we do to keep our heart healthy? So again, to kick things off, I'm Nick Ruthman. I'm also tonight's moderator. I've been practicing here at the Cleveland Clinic for about five years. I'm located at our central campus hub, just east of sunny, beautiful downtown Cleveland. I specialize in cardiovascular imaging, and I see the entire spectrum of patients for various heart health concerns. I'm the director of digital health and telemedicine for our Cardiac Institute, and I have a lot of passion for health technology and innovation, so I'm really excited to deep dive into a few related questions that were submitted tonight. I also see quite a few of my patients virtually as appropriate. I'd be more than happy to connect with any of you to assess your heart health and talk through your individualized risk of developing a heart condition in the future. In the busyness of my life to keep my heart healthy, I'm an avid cyclist and a much slower, more novice runner. I've spent a lot of time this winter on my Peloton. I truly enjoy the intensity of the workout I can fit into a small window of time, as well as the community aspect to home connected fitness. It also provides me a great outlet of activity and helps to stress when I get home from work for diving into first time dad duties into a five month old baby girl. So next on the panel, I'd like to introduce now a colleague, Dr. Chung, and have him tell you a little bit about himself. Thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name again is Roy Chung. I'm a electrophysiologist who specializes in heart rhythm, and I've been practicing for seven years at the Cleveland Clinic. I predominantly see patients in the Avon Satellite Office on the west side, and we operate at Fairview Hospitals. My area of interest mainly is in cardiac ablations for arrhythmia, arrhythmias and also uh, conduction system pacing in patients who needs pacemaker therapy. In the business of, of life, how, how do I keep myself or my heart healthy? Well, I have four children and all four are in four different soccer teams. So that gets me going enough. And we also have a, a two-year-old golden retriever. So as you well know, our two-year-old retriever does not like to sit at home and she gets us going for two to three walks every day. So after work, you know, I do to take her for a walk at least for an hour or so. That keeps me young and heart healthy. Fantastic, Dr. Chung. Awesome. And uh, gosh, I, I thought I was busy with just having one. Um, and passing the baton right over next to get to know is Dr. Kaminsky. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ruthman, and thanks, everybody, for logging on tonight. I hope this will be a great event where you get to learn something uh, that you didn't know before, and hopefully we can help educate you. Um, I've been practicing cardiology for now more than 14 years. Um, I trained at Cleveland Clinic. I was very lucky to have uh, excellent training and expertise graduating in 2009 from the cardiology training program there. I am a, a clinical cardiologist, and so um, I'm often the, the first cardiologist that you will see if your doctor wants you to see a cardiologist, because that kind of specializes in, in all different types of heart disease, whether it might be congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, heart rhythm disorders, or valvular heart disease, for example. Um, we'll often uh, always uh, evaluate people who have specific cardiac complaints as well, such as chest pain or shortness of breath, 
to try and, and discern whether your problem might be due to heart disease as well. Um, I'll always, uh, one of the reasons I like practicing at Cleveland Clinic is that we have an entire stable of incredible subspecialists. And so if I can't treat your problem or I determine that you need to see one of those subspecialists, I always have somebody who's an expert in that type of heart disease. Um, what do I do to keep myself, uh, you know, healthy in the busyness of life? One thing that I that I like to do, and I tell people, is that I never take the elevator or the escalator. I always take the stairs. So if there is some place where I can take the stairs, I do it. Um, and so it's often in the hospital, and I practice at a couple of different hospitals in the east side, um, South Point Hospital and Hillcrest Hospital. And South Point's actually nine different floors. I You will often see me in the stairwell going up and down from the first floor to the ninth floor just to get a little extra heart rate and a few extra steps during the course of the day. Awesome. Fantastic. And then the final member of tonight's expert panel, I'd like to introduce Dr. Salehi. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon, and I, I will try to do my best to answer the questions. I'm interventional a structural cardiologist, and uh, my story is a little bit different than others. I worked five years as an interventional cardiologist in Iran, and then when I came to the U.S., I repeat my residency fellowship, and now it's six months that I start in Akron General Cleveland Clinic, uh, and uh, doing the interventional uh, procedures there. I uh, see all the patients in Akron General as an outpatient and inpatient uh, clinic all uh, together. And the uh, area that I'm more involved with is transcutaneous uh, intervention or procedures, either coronary or valve disease or any congenital like ASD, PFO, which uh, population know it as a hole in the heart. So I can help to treat those. And in a busy life, I try to do my steps, 10,000 steps every day and trying to eat healthy. Although I have some escape days, I, I have to be honest, but I will try to eat more healthy food. Fantastic. Well, now that you've gotten to know our panel, I think it's time to just dive right in and start answering questions. Again, we received more than 700 questions from you all covering a wide range of topics from atrial fibrillation to wearable technology, thoughts on proper exercise and more. So we'll try to get through as many of these as we can in roughly the next 45 minutes. So the first question is for Dr. Kaminsky. When should a person, let's say specifically for those folks over 65 years or older, seek care or guidance from a cardiologist? Is it just coming in as a purely preventative measure or is it just better to see a cardiologist after a heart event's already occurred? And to what degree do we kind of coach folks on lifestyle modifications before and after a heart event does happen? Well, excellent. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I appreciate the question. And this is a great question, uh, you know, if you're seeking the care of a cardiologist. So I think there's probably two parts to this question. Number one would be, you know, in an ideal world, you know, what we do and then what happens really in practice and practicality. I will tell you that, you know, unfortunately, cardiologists are a commodity. It's kind of a scarce resource. And so I think most of us would say in practicality, we end up seeing patients, you know, after they have some sort of heart disease that's been diagnosed or identified. However, we would really like to see more people if we could, you know, to prevent that heart disease from happening in the first place, if that's possible. Um, and so we, there is a subspecialty of cardiology called preventive cardiology. Uh, and, uh, you know, they do specialize in trying to identify those patients who are at high risk of disease. And so that kind of then, um, you know, really kind of, you know, leads to the question, well, how do we find those people who might be at high risk? How do you identify those people? And uh, it's actually, you know, fairly simplistic. You know, the first thing I, I would encourage people to do is have a conversation with your doctor because there are a couple of tools that we can use to identify what your risk might be. Now, you know, this some of this might be obvious, you know, somebody who has high cholesterol or has high blood pressure, or if there's a family history of heart disease in your family where multiple individuals have had, uh, you know, heart disease, uh, you know, so particularly identified at a younger age, um, you might think that you're at elevated risk. Um, and there are some, a few online scoring tools that we use that are kind of universal in trying to predict what that risk might be. So a great starting point would be a tool that you can actually look up online and put, plug your numbers into. If you search just ACC, ASCVD, so it's the American College of Cardiology scoring tool for um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So ACC, 
ASCVD, and that'll pull up a scoring calculator for you. And you can plug in your age, uh, your gender, um, also your cholesterol numbers, if you know those numbers from cholesterol, as well as your blood pressure, and whether you're taking any blood pressure medications, and whether you're a smoker or a diabetic. Just using those pieces of information, we can predict, uh, based upon you know a whole cohort of patients, what your risk of heart disease might be over the next 10 years. And using that starting point, we generally recommend, you know, if somebody has a risk score greater than about seven and a half percent, that you might be at elevated, we call it uh, elevated risk of having heart disease. And there are some other things your doctor can do, um, you know, to potentially assess that risk a little bit further. Some of these things are controversial for screening, but one test which has actually gotten a lot more traction over the last 10 years or so is something called a CT calcium score. And that calcium score can kind of really further drill down and to assess whether that person who might be at intermediate risk, whether you might be at higher risk than you might think based upon your risk factors, or whether you might be at lower risk. And it can really kind of help uh, uh, differentiate if you would need to be, you know, further evaluated or treated for that risk, you know, say with certain medications like statin drugs. Um, a lot of people would think uh, that a stress test might be the next step. Stress testing is a little bit controversial, but you'll often find that it's just a regular exercise treadmill stress test might be a really good starting point to potentially assess your risk um, of, uh, of disease, of cardiovascular disease. Um, so those, those are some good prevention tools that we have. Your primary care doctor can often order those tools to kind of help assess the risk. And then depending upon the results of those tests, then pass you on to a cardiologist who can make that assessment further. So then the other question about coaching, um, yeah, we, we do actually, you know, coach our patients a lot for prevention, but also also after they have had a heart event, you know, um, and uh, congestive heart failure, or if they've had a heart attack or something like that. Um, as always, as you might expect, we recommend a healthy diet. One of the healthiest diets that's out there that's been proven to reduce your risk of heart disease is a Mediterranean diet. Plant-based diets are also really catching on and have some good evidence that they lower the risk of heart disease overall. And we can't overstate the benefit of exercise. Exercise, exercise, exercise. It is almost impossible to find a heart condition that won't be improved with more cardiovascular exercise. And so we really recommend that to patients. You know, a minimum recommended amount is 150 minutes per week. Um, and actually, as a matter of fact, the more you exercise uh, duration per week, uh, the lower your risk of, of heart disease is going to be in the future. So, you know, I hope I, I answered that question, but there's a lot that we can do to try and assess that risk. Um, and the first step I'd say is talk to your doctor to ask if you have a question or concern about your cardiovascular risk, they can order some of those tests for you and then get you to a cardiologist if those, those tests are abnormal. Fantastic. Great response. Really hit a lot of key points there. Uh, kind of switching gears a bit now to, to Dr. Chung, uh, specifically about atrial fibrillation as a type of heart rhythm. How do you distinguish that from other regular types of heart rhythms? And what are some options that you have in your toolbox or toolkit to manage this abnormal heart rhythm for folks? Thanks, uh, Nick. So basically atrial fibrillation is something that we see very commonly in the uh, electrophysiology clinic. Um, it is a irregular chaotic rhythm in the top chamber, in the top chamber causing at times, very rapid uh, pulse, uh, or at times, you know, they are quite slow. They're not. They're not rapid at all. So everyone is different. Their symptoms are very different. What are the risk factors for atrial fibrillation? Um, sleep apnea is one common uh, contributing trigger that a lot of people uh, underestimate. The other thing could be uh, uh, alcohol intake. And then finally, being overweight uh, can put a lot of stress in our lungs and our heart. It cause our heart to go to atrial fibrillation. Secondly, we decide then, you know, if patients need to be ha uh, have a rhythm control strategy or a rate control strategy. So what that means is, depending on their symptoms, we will decide which route they take, whether they feel a lot better in rhythm, and if they do, how are we going to approach that? There are several ways. Uh, if their pulse is very fast, we start off with very basic therapy called a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. What it does is that it will slow your heart rate down a little bit so it doesn't wear the heart out. Secondly, a lot of times I will try something like what we call an antiarrhythmic drug therapy. 
So it's a drug that will help convert a patient from atrial fibrillation to a normal rhythm. And finally, there's what we call catheter ablation or AF ablation. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, later uh, in our session today. One key thing that we should think about is blood thinner. Um, when the top chamber or your atrium is fibrillating, it tends to pull blood uh, and cause a blood clot. This is one, one of the most underrecognized causes of a stroke. So when the blood pulls, a small, tiny clot can, can form uh, in what we call the left atrial appendage. And when it's this larger, usually it goes up to your to the vessels in the neck and up to the brain. So a lot of times patients are diagnosed with a stroke, and you know, we always look for triggers such as atrial fibrillation. So these are the common things that we think about as blood thinner, medicines to, to keep your pulse slower when you're in atrial fibrillation, and finally anti-AFib or anti-rhythmic drug. Fantastic. Really thorough and you know, atrial fibrillation is always kind of a uh, tricky. Sometimes people feel it right away. They know the minute they go into AFib and other times they wouldn't have a clue unless they were hooked up to a monitor or had some device to really pick it up. So there's a lot of key uh, key findings there to kind of to discuss through. All right, moving on to kind of focus on uh, women's health and in and, and the, and the cardiac space with Dr. Salehi. Uh, what are heart attack symptoms specific for women? Are they the same as men or, or are there some differences there? And how can someone tell the difference between, let's say, having a heart attack and another cause of chest pain, such as like having heartburn? Thanks, Nick. It's a very interesting question. For the first part, uh, females obviously can have the same symptoms as the male. The typical chest pain, which been uh, discussed and explained as a mid-external pain, pressure, or a crushing pain that usually uh, can radiate to the left hand or uh, to the jaw. And uh, it usually comes with activity or a stress and can be get better by resting or using the sublingual nitro after five minutes. So uh, this is uh, the common among uh, most population, female and male. But uh, the things that is these days are uh, discussed and is important, females can have some atypical uh, symptoms that uh, usually cause um, the coronary syndrome be missed among them. Those symptoms can be shortness of breath, nausea, diaphoresis, lightheadedness, fatigue, weakness, numbness, palpitation, uh, some feeling of indigestion, confusion. So it can be a very extensive uh, sign or symptoms that still can uh, be a sign of the heart problem, especially in females. Males can have any of these with the symptoms of the heart, but it's more common among the female population. And about the heartburn, uh, yeah, that's uh, one of the most important differential diagnosis with the uh, basically heart between the pain that we have as a heartburn or the heart disease. It's a little bit challenging to differentiate that, but mostly when we have a heartburn, it comes uh, right after we eat. It can get subsided by uh, anaesthes or when we take the medication PPI like uh, Protonix or other uh, type from the same family. And when it is from the heart, usually uh, when we are active or we get a stress, we get these symptoms of heartburn or if we even eat a heavy meal, because having a heavy meal can be a kind of a stress on the body and the heart and can cause these symptoms. And one of the most differentiation is these symptoms can be getting better by sublingual nitro, though some of the esophageal disease still can respond to the sublingual nitro. So if we go more toward the heart problem or any of these symptoms, it's better to visit any physician, our primary doctor or ER or urgent care. So not to miss any cardiac symptoms because it's always be better to be uh, cautious than be sorry later. 
Absolutely. Yeah, great response. And I always tell folks that if you feel something, say something, it's better to seek care than to sit on things for sure. Um, all right, the next question I think I'll take. Uh, someone wrote in and, and said that they'd be especially interested in how best to use data from wearable devices to monitor our heart health symptoms as well as their limitations. And such a timely topic. It seems like more and more folks have some sort of a wearable device, either a band or a watch on their wrist or a ring on their finger, something to monitor their vitals and their heart health. And these digital tools, you know, I, I think they're here to stay. And I fully embrace them. I, I use the data from these devices every day in the care of my patients. You know, it is heart month here in February. We have a whole campaign called Love Your Heart that's focused on providing everyone with heart health information that's well-researched and reviewed and provided from our experts here at the Cleveland Clinic. And as a component of this campaign, particularly this year, we surveyed a thousand people from all across the U.S. on this particular topic. Basically, how are Americans using technology to improve their heart health? And how do they feel about the emerging role of artificial intelligence in the care of their hearts? And, you know, the findings were actually pretty pretty interesting. 50% of Americans use at least one type of technology to monitor their heart. The majority, about 60%, monitor daily steps. Next in line is monitoring heart rate, calories burned, even sleep. And most folks who use some form of a wearable find that it increases their motivation to be active, their sense of accountability for their health. Half of Americans that we polled felt that exercise was increased as a result, and their focus on better eating habits also changed as just having this device around their wrist or on their hand or attached to them some way, somehow. And a third said that they actually pay more attention to sleep patterns and sleep quality. So for as a cardiologist, you know, these are landfall wins. Having all this data, having individualized data trends over time, having patients more invested, more involved in their health and creating these behavioral changes, these nudges behaviorally towards being more in tune with your body and your heart. It's really super exciting for me to see. Uh, patients become more empowered. They take control of and improve their heart health. In fact, 80% of Americans that we surveyed felt that using this wearable device directly led both to physical health changes and to mental health changes too. They actually had more energy and interest to de-stress, to relax, and to increase emphasis on mental health and sense of well-being overall. Now that said, wearables have their limits. The accuracy of wearables are not perfect. The vast sheer volume of data can be overwhelming, both for the patient and a physician to sift through. You know, for some, there's this temptation to get overly micro-focused on each data point that is tracked and potentially perseverate on any slight variations observed. So I try to caution folks up front for this, but specific to the data accuracy, I still end up saying that it's all about trust but verify. So if a device you have, or if you wish to wear one of these, and it shows an abnormal heart rhythm or an abnormal alarm goes off about one of your health matrix, it's always best to confirm that your cardiologist agrees with that finding before really taking it as truth. And in fact, going back to that survey of a thousand folks around the US, 90% would still seek their doctor's advice before acting on an alert from a wearable or any artificial intelligence driven recommendation. So I think the country at large, and we as a cardiology community are pretty much on a similar page that wearables and digital health technologies are here to stay, but their use should never really replace seeing a physician, having that personalized connection and relationship with your health provider. All right, enough on that. I could probably talk about wearables all night. Dr. Kaminsky, back to you. Uh, what lab tests are recommended for seniors to best assess their cardiac health? Great, excellent. Thank you, Nick. Um, so yeah, there, there are a variety of lab tests. I, I kind of alluded to it a little bit in the first question that I answered at the beginning of the session was your, uh, your cholesterol. So what is your, we call this a lipid profile. And so you often, um, you often hear physicians say lipid profile, but then what that means is that those are your cholesterol numbers. And we break down those cholesterol numbers into several different types of cholesterol. So there's your total cholesterol, uh, but then there's also two different types of cholesterol that we call HDL and LDL. And these stand for high density lipoprotein and low density lipoprotein. So we tend to think of LDL as the bad cholesterol because what that drives is a lot of the cholesterol plaque that gets into our arteries. Uh, and the, the HDL cholesterol is the good cholesterol. And the reason why we call it good cholesterol is the best way to think this molecule is it actually kind of can go into to the arteries and actually remove plaque from the artery walls and uh, transport it back to the liver where most cholesterol is manufactured. There's a couple of other different types that you'll often see sometimes in the lipid profile called VLDL. It's called very low density lipoprotein and then also triglycerides. But the main one that you want to focus on really is that LDL cholesterol, because that LDL cholesterol really drives that risk 
of what we call atherosclerotic vascular disease. So those, those cholesterol plaques that can get into the coronary arteries or even the other different arteries in your body in the, in, into your carotid arteries or even the arteries down in your legs. And so really lowering that LDL cholesterol um, is really one of the, the mainstays and the linchpins of our therapy to try and prevent people from having heart disease. Now, if your doctor is really sophisticated, they may actually also assess um, a different kind of cholesterol um, or it's a, it's a different way to assess it called um, apolipoprotein B. You'll see ApoB. And many cardiologists uh, seem to think that this is a better measure of risk than LDL cholesterol. But I think 99% of the time, you're going to find that your doctor measures the cholesterol levels. And again, LDL is that number. If you're going to remember one number, it's that, L that LDL number. Now, there's a couple of other tests that could probably be useful um, to you as well. And one, especially if there's a strong family history of heart disease, particularly of coronary artery disease in the family or valve disease, uh, one test is called a lipoprotein A. Many people have not heard of this test, but it's actually uh, been known about for over 50 years. And we're, we're beginning you know, to really recognize over the past couple of decades, the role that lipoprotein A plays in causing heart disease. It's actually a it's a it's a it's a kind of a cholesterol molecule. It has a component of LDL cholesterol to it, um, but it's also it has another component to it called an ApoA molecule, and, and it makes it particularly uh, bad when it comes to causing a lot of atherosclerotic vascular disease. And so we often find that this is responsible for causing uh, heart disease that, that, that in, in multiple family members because it's in a highly inherited genetic form of cholesterol. Finally, one test which I think is probably underused, which is good to check and that your doctor can check as well, is called a C-reactive protein. And uh, the, the particular version which has been well studied is called high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And this is often used as a screening test in otherwise healthy people to check the overall amount of inflammation in the arteries. We really increasingly recognize over the past couple of decades that what can put people at risk for a heart attack is not necessarily just the cholesterol, but it's how it's the amount of inflammation that's which contained within the arteries. And so people who have um, inflamed plaques or in, a lot of inflammation in the body um, are at higher risk of having vascular disease events like a heart attack or a stroke. We've even seen that pa patients who have autoimmune disease, like even say like rheumatoid arthritis, who have high levels of inflammation in the body, those patients are a little bit of a higher risk of having heart disease as well. And so that, that, uh, that assessment of C-reactive protein can often be a marker of uh, a vascular risk. There's even a couple of landmark studies that were done that showed that people who had high levels of C-reactive protein, when they were treated with statin medications, um, that actually lowered their risk of having a heart attack or a stroke over time. So those are just a few tests. But if there's one test you, that you should really know and really remember, um, it's the lipid profile and specifically that LDL cholesterol. Fantastic. Yeah, entirely agree. And I would say that uh, a lot of my patients are still kind of learning about this LP little a, and it's really kind of a novel marker for many. I would just offer that anybody on this call, if, if you haven't had your lipoprotein A checked, just write down those three letters. Next time you meet with your primary care doctor, just ask to have it one time drawn. It's really all it takes is just to see if you have a genetically low amount or a screaming sky high amount. And even though we don't have a medicine that's tailored for it specifically right now in 2024, we're actually getting close. I would say in the next handful of years, we're going to have something very specific to tailor to drop that down as well. Awesome. Um, Dr. Salehi, back to you. If there's a leaky heart valve, which was discovered by your cardiologist, is this a serious thing and, and how can it become worse? Uh, thanks, Nick. Yeah, you know, uh, the leaky valves, it depends on uh, many different factors, including the degree of this leakage from the valve and the size of the heart uh, that this chamber is, uh, this valve is connected to that, the function of that uh, chamber usually is left ventricle, and the sign and symptoms that the patient have. The leaky valve, uh, basically each valve can go from normal to mild leak, moderate and severe leak. 
that based on any of these degree, we have a guideline that we will uh, follow our patients. In a mild uh, leak, leaky valves, we usually would like to repeat their echo every three to five years. But at the same time, we would like they see uh, either the primary doctor or the cardiologist every year to have an exam and uh, do the physical exam and uh, discuss about their sign and symptoms. If any change in any of these, we may request an earlier uh, echocardiography. If it is moderate, usually one to two year echo, but at the same time, the same follow-up of every year. And if we have a severe uh, leaky valve, usually between six to 12 months, we will uh, follow and request a repeat echo. What I would uh, recommend, if we are going toward the moderate to severe, I really uh, think it's worth it to have a cardiology to follow these patients, although it still can be followed with our primary physicians. And when it gets to the point, uh, send to the cardiology or uh, um, intervention or surgical. But it's much better to be followed with cardiology to uh, follow all of these. And uh, when we need to intervene, it's uh, basically when it gets severe leaky valve, definitely that's the time that we have to intervene with a moderate leaky valve. We have some other uh, criteria that if has been added to that, like symptoms or the size of the heart, we may move forward and intervene upon that. Usually the uh, treatment for these is either um, surgical repair or surgical replacement of the valve. But nowadays there are certain uh, situations and specific patients that can go with the percutaneous repair of the mitral valve or tricuspid valve for a leakage and uh, can be treated. But uh, the criteria is very limited and it's not for all the patients because still surgery has the best outcome and the uh, best uh, basically symptom-free uh, survival. Yeah, I, I think it's great, um, Dr. Slea. The other thing I, I would reassure patients to, you know, in our practice to say, the majority of patients who have leaky heart valves, you know, are probably never going to need to have heart surgery or have anything done about that. It does require some monitoring though, because as Dr. Slea mentioned, you know, that valve leak could get worse over time. But if you have a leaky heart valve, your chances are still probably pretty slim that you're going to need to have open heart surgery. So rest assured, that should, should certainly be monitored over time and watched by your cardiologist, but that's probably, you know, the worst that's going to happen to you more than likely. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, well, moving on and kind of shifting gears back to uh, heart rhythm and abnormalities. This is back to Dr. Chung. Uh, someone wrote in that they have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and it's been well controlled for several years with medication, but occasionally having breakthrough symptoms. When is it time to kind of move to that next step and consider having an ablation? Thanks, thanks, Nick. Uh, great question. So atrial fibrillation is a progressive condition. So what paroxysm means, means is that it comes and go initially, it will last for several minutes or several hours in the initial stages of atrial fibrillation. After several years, patients can start getting more and more symptoms um, more frequently. And once they are in atrial fibrillation for a long period of time, we, we term this as persistent atri atrial fibrillation where they will need what we call cardioversion or paddling of the heart. Most patients would kind of know when they would need to move on from being on medicine to something else. Uh, for somebody that I follow, I would always start them on antiarrhythmic drug therapy uh, for a few months or for a few years to kind of see how they feel. If they start having more and more symptoms, what I will tell them typically is that it is time for them to think about an ablation because it is an effective therapy and you don't want to get them to an end stage atrial fibrillation but because it is too late. So we have clinical trials that have shown that earlier ablation does work. It works better because AFib makes AFib worse, where your left atrium can dilate, it gets bigger and bigger, and it's a lot more difficult to have rhythm restoration. 
So when I meet anyone in the first time, we kind of I kind of spell it out the stages of atrial fibrillation, the progression, where they're at, what all the options are. Everyone will have at be at different stages. Everyone will have different opinions and different different options. So we kind of lay it out and we kind of walk with them their journey of AF. And a lot of times, people that undergo AF ablations do do very well, and we get them off these antiarrhythmic uh, drug therapies. Right. Any other thoughts, Nick? No, I think you really hit that. You know, I think there's always uh, less invasive is always better, but sometimes, and as you're mentioning, recent data really kind of drives home that if we feel like we can have a successful, more invasive correction that can be more curative, then we're really kind of preventing the recurrence of this and protecting your heart health really long term. Um, so great insights there. Just just one, yeah. one more thing to add, Nick, is that the, the catheter ablation is getting safer and safer now, and one has to look for high volume sensors. This is what we, we always recommend. Uh, AF sensors, uh, sensors where physicians have done a lot of these cases, it's getting safer and safer. Um, we send patients home the same day now. There are technologies that are coming up in the pipeline that are even safer, uh, what we call pulse field ablation. So we have clinical trials that's up and running right now at the Cleveland Clinic. It is commercialized in Europe, uh, not in the U.S. yet, but it is available at certain centers like ours because we're part of uh, national clinical trials. So this is another benefit of us here at the Cleveland Clinic. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Really timely way in and, and follow up there. I think that's so important just to, you know, if you're having an opinion and I'll kind of maybe talk about this in a bit, but if you're being reviewed for something that you know, it's a smaller center or, you know, maybe they, they're just getting their feet off the ground and doing a procedure. Um, it's always a value to try to find a center of excellence where really they've not done one or 10 or, or, or a few hundred, but many thousand. And if they've seen a curveball, they've seen it more than once. And, um, you know, I think that we're, we're fortunate here to have a lot of different uh, subspecialists and experts in multiple fields from heart rhythm issues to more blockage based therapies and surgeries to fix valves and everything that we've mentioned so far. And um, it really is kind of the melding of kind of the expert of minds and also the clinical background that we've seen, not one kind of variant or, or abnormality, but but five or 10 or 15 different versions of that already before you would come and see us. And so we're, we're prepared. Um, Dr. Slay, back to you. Uh, this is again, less from the uh, electrical side and more on the plumbing side of the heart. What is the average lifespan of a stent and, and when, if ever, would a stent need to be replaced? That's a very interesting question, Nick, and many, many patients have these questions. So stents, if we put it in the vessel, it's there forever. It will stay there. And in the early time when we put a stand for a new stents that we have now, about three to six months, older ones, it was taking six to 12 months, that the inner layer of the vessel can go and cover, uh, grow over the stents and cover it and it will become totally part of the body. And uh, usually, uh, after that, there is a uh, less risk, and that's why we put our patients on dual antiplatelet therapy that uh, people know as a blood thinner, to for to give this time that the stent become part of the body and the metal is not exposed to the blood anymore. So it can uh, for that time, it uh, these uh, antiplatelet therapy can prevent any clot formation, and after that, as uh, the risk is very minimal, there is no need for that. And uh, as we all know, when we put a stand, usually, especially with the new technology, new form of the stands that we have available, the chance of getting uh, another blockage in the stands, it is there, but it's very minimal. It's become less and less as we get a new, with the, go with this new technology. But the main problem and having a progression of the coronary artery disease or plug formation in other parts of the vessel or different vessels is there. And if those get there, that's the time that we can go and basically uh, 
reevaluate for either a stent, another stent in that area, or um, sending for a surgery. There, um, the small amount of patients that will get in a uh, basically a stenosis again in the same uh, stent, we have some uh, modality to treat that, like balloon it or put another stent there, or if we feel that. Uh, it's the time to move forward with the open heart surgery, refer them for the open heart surgery. And uh, the things that are very important as uh, other colleagues discuss about that is basically to prevent the progression of other plaques or even mm, re-stenosis is lifestyle modification, which is about the diet, activity, quit smoking, and uh, basically, mm, some of the medications like a statin, PSK-9 inhibitors now, they show that it will uh, delay the progression of the lesions in the other part of the vessel or in the same part that we put a stent. And these are important to prevent that. We never can remove the stent. When we put the stent, a stent is there forever. We can put another stent or send for a surgery. Even the patients go for a surgery, they will usually not touch the stent, just go beyond that and bypass it. Great. Great way in there. All right. I think the next one is, is actually uh, ping pong back to me. So how does one go about getting a heart second opinion at the Cleveland Clinic specifically? And how do we work with local doctors and kind of referring to doctors uh, back in people's local communities? So fantastic question. I kind of want to touch a base a little bit about second opinions in general. You know, I think we're so fortunate here to have the trust from folks that truly come from all over the country and the world. People come here every day to receive a second, sometimes third, maybe even a fourth opinion about their heart. And it's honestly, I think, what fills the majority of all of our practices on this call tonight and up to the more than 100 to, to 200 total cardiologists that we have here within the Cleveland Clinic umbrella. And I really like to think that we're just really excellent at this. And one or two outcomes occurs. Either we have a multidisciplinary heart team review and we land on the exact same diagnosis and the care plan as your local cardiologist or your local primary care doctor, or maybe we provide an entirely new perspective and avenue to treat your heart. And knowing that if we needed to intervene in any way, in our own backyard here, we have world experts in every subspecialty and field to give patients really the best chance to have a successful outcome and quality of life. So really providing second opinions to a patient is absolutely one of the best parts of probably all of our jobs. It truly takes a team effort, and I sincerely believe that we're able to offer just this level of service to people, and it's a core reason why it makes a lot of us wish to be here in, in Cleveland and not associated with the clinic. And I say this all the time, that really the best advocate for your health is you. And if you don't feel that you have a comprehensive care plan or you have symptoms that aren't improving or you just don't feel like you have the right diagnosis, this is really our bread and butter and we're truly here to help. And so direct to the question of how to get a second opinion with us, anyone can set up an appointment with us really at any time. Like I said, there's nearly 200 cardiologists, vascular medicine doctors, cardiothoracic surgeons here in the Northeast Ohio Cleveland Clinic Network. And we're just a phone call away. I mean, literally you can get on the phone tomorrow and call 216-444-6697 and start setting an appointment up. You can also request an appointment online. You fill out a few boxes. Best to have your insurance data there with you. It takes about 10 minutes to complete, and someone gets back to you in one to two days. We can see you in person as a new patient. We can also see you in some cases virtually as well. If you live out of state, many states away, or just getting here is physically a challenge, we do have a virtual second opinion program. Now, this is not covered by insurance, but it's really a wonderful resource uh, to confirm a care plan locally. If you're receiving a new diagnosis or you've had to work up an evaluation, you just kind of want to have kind of that center of excellence sort of second pass to review all your information and get a, a desired expert view and opinion. Um, we have that as another offering as well. And in many cases, we just reaffirm what your providers already provided to you and give you reassurance. But sometimes it creates that meaningful relationship where maybe someone's willing to make that longer drive or get in the plane and come and connect with us in person once a year and kind of keep that relationship going. Should anything ever happen with your heart or you needed to kind of go to the, that next rung of therapy or treatment, then we're just a phone call away and we can expedite that transition and get you the care you need. And I equally realize that in any healthcare system, there are wait times, there are delays in getting that first appointment and kind of getting proverbially in the door. We do have an automated wait list. So if a sooner appointment opens up, boom, a text message pops up on your phone and says, hey, 
you know, instead of being two months down the road, can you come and, and connect with us this Friday? And, and you can say yes or no. And if so, we can try to get you that appointment sooner. Um, I see patients like this every day. I see brand new patients that literally got on the chart or picked up the phone and called that same day that they wanted to see a cardiologist. Sometimes it's next day. Sometimes it's the next week. And, you know, we're such a large group. Seeing any cardiologist under the Northeast Ohio umbrella wearing a Cleveland Clinic logo gets you the same resources, the same experts, the same multidisciplinary care team, and the same access to the right care that you need. And it really takes a village and a, and a support team. And, I, you know, similar to what Dr. Kaminsky is saying, you know, I think our job on the front end is to really act as champions and quarterbacks and to really coordinate care and figure out who are the key expert people that need to come together and come up with the right care plan and diagnosis and treatment. We're always trying to find innovative ways to improve access to care. And just a last quick comment about our interaction with local providers. And I think we all try to do our very best to relay care plans back and review and get that feedback back to your primary care doctor, your local cardiologist. I mean, this is really a team sport. Uh, here in the electronic medical record era, a lot of that is transiently and transparently kind of immediately sent over and across. So we do have review of imaging and progress notes and sort of our general care plan put down on paper. Um, but there's no replacing close to home access to care, to have that cardiology touch point. And we do all that we can. Sometimes I'm picking up the phone and, and circling back with that referring provider. Uh, it really means a lot for them to have that feeling that we're a phone a friend there for any time that they need something that's maybe a little bit outside of their scope or scale. And so that's really kind of the driving point home about these second opinions and really access to care. There's many ways that you can come in and see us. And again, we have so many folks and, and, and to Dr. Kaminsky's also earlier point, the more that we can see you on the front end before you have a heart event, the more that we can really kind of dive in and modify your risk and prevent something from ever happening. All right, so I think I'm actually flipping it right back to you, Dr. Kaminsky, about blood pressure. Great, excellent. Uh, thanks very much, Nick. So yeah, so the question about blood pressure, and I, and I think this is a fantastic question because you know, blood pressure, high blood pressure is so common, you know, is, uh, you know, is really the question, um, you know, can a blood pressure reading be different at different times of the day? And what does this mean if it's different at different times of the day? And so I think everybody who has high blood pressure has probably experienced this at one point in time, is that you're checking your blood pressure, whether it be with your own cuff at home, or whether you go to the doctor's office, and you say, these readings are different. How can these readings be so different? You know, if my blood pressure, I'm on blood pressure medication um, and you know, I'm taking my blood pressure. And so it's very frustrating to have all these different readings. And I think it's important to kind of know a little bit about the factors that go into making some of those blood pressure readings different. So the first one that I, that I want to just kind of address is what's the difference between the home blood pressure readings and the office blood pressure readings? And I think a lot of people kind of notice this. There's a very, very, very common entity out there called white coat hypertension. And so you may find that when you go to your doctor, doctor's office that your blood pressure is often measured higher. And this can be, you know, just, you know, a few points higher, five or 10 points, millimeters of mercury higher, or it can be sometimes even 20 or 30 points higher for that blood pressure just in the office. And people say, listen, I, I don't feel nervous. I'm, I'm calm, right? You, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, you know um, perturbed by my cardiologist, but, you know, yet that, that blood pressure is still higher. And for that reason, we like to have patients check their blood pressure at home as well, because often that home environment is where we get the most accurate resting blood pressures. So what are other factors that can affect the blood pressure? Well, just the time of day can do it, you know, as the questioner kind of asked. And, and what we find is when we look at blood pressure over the course of the time of day, it's often lowest in some of the morning hours or some of the late morning hours. Then there's a rise throughout the course of the day, and it peaks actually in the late afternoon. And then it actually dips a little bit again towards bedtime. Now, this may not be the same for everybody, but that's a general pattern of blood pressures at the rise over the course of the day with a peak in the late afternoon or the early evening. So that's normal. If you're finding that that's kind of the pattern that you have, that's a normal pattern for your blood pressure. I think it's also important to know that uh, different levels of stress and physical activity can also uh, affect the blood pressure too. If you just kind of ran in the house and you sat right down, you put the blood pressure cuff on your arm um, and uh, you had a particularly stressful kind of day or stressful commute, that blood pressure is going to be higher. That stress and that physical activity can also raise that blood pressure. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, technique is especially important when you are checking your blood pressure at home. There's a variety of different you know, things that you can do to be able to have the correct technique of measuring your blood pressure. So we encourage people to be in a seated position. You wanna be sitting down 
in a very comfortable chair. You want to have your back supported, okay? You want to also have your feet flat on the floor and your legs uncrossed. You want to be sitting for at least five or 10 minutes to really let your body kind of rest and relax. You want to have your arms supported as well. So you want to have this supported on an armrest or a table next to you so that you're not holding it up, okay, or it's not low, so that it's just really just kind of at rest. And then let that blood pressure cuff inflate. Um, also, you should not be talking. Interestingly enough, if you're talking during that blood pressure, that can actually raise it by about five millimeters of mercury. So you want to be quiet when it's taking that blood pressure reading. Oftentimes, many experts will recommend taking a second or even a third blood pressure reading a, a minute or two later, and that can actually get you a true resting blood pressure. So, you know, you know, all of those, all those factors, if you're using that technique, the correct technique of tra tracking a resting blood pressure, you're going to notice that you may get a little bit better consistency in checking your blood pressure. I think it's also important is that we should be using cuffs that are on the upper arm. Those are generally um, more accurate than the ones that are typically on the wrist. Um, so upper arm cuffs. And then the last part that's a really important is you want to have an appropriately sized blood pressure cuff as well. A cuff that's too small, that doesn't fit around your arm, there should be significant overlap on that cuff can actually give you uh, an error, an erroneously high blood pressure reading. So if you notice that that cuff isn't fitting you well, you can ask your at your drugstore or your local medical supply company for a large cuff that accurately fits your arm, uh, and, and that'll give you a more accurate blood pressure reading. There's a variety of automated blood pressure cuffs out there. Those are the easiest ones to use, um, and they're, most of them are pretty accurate. The last thing you can do is you can bring your blood pressure cuff in you know, to the doctor's office with you, measure that against the uh, the uh, the automatic um, or the you know the manual cuff that uh, that your doctor's office has um, and that's going to get you actually the most accurate blood pressure reading um, you know so that you know if your manual cuff actually is is calibrated correctly and if it matches up with your doctor's um, you know um, or your automatic cuff matches up with your doctor's manual reading fantastic Great insight there. Okay, kind of switching back to gears on uh, blockages and heart arteries and, and a little bit deeper dive into that back with Dr. Saleh here. Is it possible to stabilize or reduce the amount of bad plaque that you may already have in a heart artery? So the reducing is still uh, not a good, uh, basically it's better we rephrase it as a delay the progression or stabilize it. Oh. This time with all the technology, we we are there are some studies around about the possibility for reducing, but mostly we can uh, basically stabilize the plaques and uh, delay the progression of those. Most of those are based on the lifestyle modification, as we discussed earlier. It's uh, basically having a good habit of eating trying to reduce the weight, trying to control the blood pressure, trying to control the um, blood glucose for the patients who have uh, diabetes, basically glycemic control. That's uh, good if we can have, uh, if we are a smoker, try to quit the smoking. Decreasing the amount and number of the cigarettes that we smoke during the day is good, but it's not enough. Uh, basically, what we will recommend is just try to quit it. And many patients will say that before they quit the smoking, they were thinking it's really hard to do it. But when they make that decision and do it, after a while, they can realize that's not uh, that was not as hard as they were thinking about it. Smoking and diabetes together are very bad to cause the progression faster than uh, we expect. Exercise can help. As you mentioned, Nick, also exercise can really help to decrease and help the heart. Uh, Matt also mentioned that before that exercise can help in every aspect of the heart, uh, can control the blood pressure, the diabetes, basically indirectly have effect on the heart and directly has effect on heart. So all of these are good on uh, delaying the progression and some medications like a statin or PSK9 inhibitor, as we discussed earlier, can uh, delay uh, the progression of the disease. Fantastic. Very thorough response. And, you know, I think that it's all about risk factor modification. If you end up having some evaluation and 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 potentially a cath is done or we do an imaging study and we find that there's some, some plaque there in a heart artery, 
the best thing you can do is just drive down all your risk factors to all the things that Dr. Salehi has mentioned here. All right. Well, I think we're kind of getting near to time. We might have one uh, final question to fit in thoroughly. I don't want to cut anybody off or cut time short. And so I'll defer back to Dr. Chung here. And somebody wrote in that said that my doctor said I'm borderline to need a pacemaker. I thought when pressed, he said if it were me, he would probably wait. So what factors are relevant in that decision? And when's the right time for someone to put that device in to help beat their heart for them? So basically, when somebody has borderline indication for a pacemaker, it really boils down to their symptoms. If your pulse is dropping beats and every now and again, but you don't really have much symptoms, then I'll tell them, I think, you know, we can wait and watch and observe, uh, have to come back maybe for serial EKGs every six months or so, or give us a call. Uh, they typically don't just faint or pass us out. They usually would have symptoms like exercise intolerance, or they can't get up the steps as much as they would like to do, or they can't get their heart rate up when you're on their treadmill. You know, their heart rate is stuck in the 40s or the 50s, no matter what they do. So it's really paying attention to sort of little details like that and, and to their body. Uh, a lot of times, if it's just a watchful waiting, we do wait for several months to several years. And they would know suddenly when, when their post starts dropping or they're stuck in the 30 and the 40 range, that would be the time to say, hey, look, some, something is not right. You know, like, like it doesn't matter what I do. Uh, my pulse is sort of stuck in this sort of low low range. Uh, and there's time really to get, a, get an EKG to kind of have a look to see what was what. What really happens at that time is that the top chamber is sort of beating at one on its own rhythm and half the pulses or impulses is going down to the bottom chamber. So it's the top and the bottom is not really talking to each other. That's where that will be the, the indication for pacemaker therapy. Awesome. Well, great. Well, that was, that was our final question of the evening. And I, I think this formally concludes this Ask the Experts event. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. And again, before the end of the week, you will all receive an email with heart healthy resources from us details on how you can make an appointment to see any of us in the clinic. And we'll send you a link to this recording just in case you wish to rewatch and view this again. I wanna thank our panel. We appreciate your time being with us tonight, checking in and tuning in to educate and kind of keep a pulse on your heart health and really to learn more about how we approach cardiac care at the Cleveland Clinic. So thank you all tuning in and listening virtually. Have a great night.